Good evening. You are an obedient class. I know that our mission is in good hands with you all. I mean, when we gather together, we do two things. We celebrate the fellowship of the officers of the American Revolution, and we de rededicate ourselves to the high mission of this organization, to perpetuate the memory of the American Revolution, which was the greatest event in favor of freedom in the history of mankind. It's our purpose to make sure that all Americans understand and appreciate that, which is why we created the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight the chairman of the Board of Overseers of the American Revolution Institute, Mr. Chuck Coltman, who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. That was a short introduction. <laughs> well done. And again, it, it is indeed an honor and a privilege for me to be the chairman of the American Revolution Institute. And this is actually the first event uh, hosted by the Society of the Cincinnati's American Revolution Institute. And all I can assure you is that there will be more. It's also the first time that we are joined by new associates of the American Revolution Institute. Our associates program is small today, but will become many. Patriotic Americans dedicated to preserving the memory and legacy of the American Revolution from the extin ex extinction which we believe it faces today. So to our new associates and allies, welcome, and we thank you for your support. But what makes tonight especially exciting for me is that the American Revolution Institute is pleased to announce an addition to its Board of Overseers, one of Washington, D.C.'s leading business people, retired CEO of Cardinal Bank, former chairman of the D.C. Chamber of Commerce, chairman of the Chevy Chase Land Trust, simply put, a dynamic, forthright, outspoken leader, known and respected by all in the Washington, D.C. area. Kate Carr, will you stand so we can express our thanks? I hope, I didn't see Kate, but I hope she's here. Yes. Thank you, Kate. We are so proud you're joining us, Kate. Uh, those of you from the Washington, D.C. area may have seen in Sunday's Washington Post an article on student and faculty activists at George Washington University seeking to change their team name from the Colonials, a name they associate with systemic oppression. That made me kind of sad. Sad particularly for their ignorance. Sad that they did not understand those colonials fled a world of oppression and tyranny to seek religious and political freedom. And when threatened again, fought and died in a revolution to protect those freedoms, created a national identity and political system based on the highest ideals, achieving the bright promise of which continues to this day. The American Revolution Institute is dedicated to replace their ignorance with a renewal of respect and honor for our founders and their achievements, still relevant today. We will do so by countering that ignorance whenever we hear it. We will do so by helping reform an education system breeding that ignorance. Our speaker today understands the relevance of our founders to the issues of today. He has reached back to the words of Washington, 
to reflect on current threats to our democracy. John Avalon's most recent book is Washington's Farewell, the Founding Fathers' Warning to Future Generations. John grew up in New York City, the grandson of Greek immigrants. He graduated from Milton Academy, Yale, and later Columbia for his MBA. A professional journalist and author by the age of 31, he soon became a fixture on CNN, PBS, MSNBC, Fox and Friends, among others. In 2010, John Avalon published his second book, and I love the name, Wingnuts, which explored fringe politics and cemented his role as a centrist among political commentators. In 2013, he became editor-in-chief of the online Daily Beast, taking it to over one million readers a day while winning awards for reporting and editorial professionalism. John retains his pluralistic, nonpartisan tone, saying, quote, we will be nonpartisan, but not neutral. We're going to hit both sides where appropriate. We're not going to tow any partisan line. For me, he says, the key quote of our times is from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said, that everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. <laughs> John, we look forward to hearing about why you wrote your latest book and what you learned about our first founder or, frankly, anything else you care to tell us. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome John Avalon. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be with you all uh, here at the American Revolution Institute and the Society of Cincinnati. Um, having written a book on Washington and his farewell address in the Founding Fathers is a, a wonderful opportunity to really take communion with our history in the founding period and to really understand and appreciate even more uh, the gift we've been given and the importance and the obligation we all have to take those first principles and play them forward. And you all are direct connections to that founding generation, that revolutionary generation. Um, and America keeps renewing. That's the genius of America. We are a nation of immigrants. We always were. But your direct connection to the past, your organization going back to Henry Knox and Alexander Hamilton and, of course, George Washington, is a great gift, not only to the memory and perpetuating the memory of the revolution, but what you can do in keeping alive the relevance of our history in today's current debates. And that's why I'm so excited about the establishment of the American Revolution Institute. I think it can play a very important role in addition to the extraordinary archives that you have collected over generations uh, under the leadership of Jack Warren now, who I had the pleasure of meeting when I was researching the book uh, at dinner in Barbados, uh, which is a non-terrible place to have dinner and talk about George Washington. I highly recommend it. Um, but as you study the Founding Fathers, as we contemplate the role of the Founding Fathers and the foundational wisdom in today's debates, it seems to me that one of the primary things we shouldn't lose is a sense of how important history not only is to us, but was to them. That when the Founding Fathers and George Washington were developing our founding documents, were imagining this first modern republic, that they were consciously drawing not only on the lessons of their lives and their experience, inevitably, but also the lessons of history up to that point. This is key. They were engaging in applied history before there was perhaps a name for it in trying to come up with a durable republic that could make this audacious idea of the American experiment work. You know, winning a bat war on a battlefield is essential. It is also not sufficient. You got to win the peace as well. And there was no more audacious experiment 
than the American Republic. I mean, even John Adams said there has not yet been a democracy that didn't die by suicide. The specter of failure haunted them. Conventional wisdom on the continent said that all democracies and democratic republics were doomed to fail unless it was on the scale of a tiny Swiss canton. You could never do it over 13 counties, over the space that we were discussing. And people also underestimate because we use our contemporary lens to judge the past, it's inevitable, but we should hedge it just a bit. Part of the challenge wasn't just the geographic sprawl, but the fact that the United States was incredibly diverse in the times and terms of its day. You know, they spoke Dutch in upstate New York, German around Germantown, French up in Vermont. Um, I mean, the warring tribes of the European countries had been fighting and killing each other for centuries. So while we today don't give a second's thought about whether someone who's German and French can live next to each other, that was kind of a big deal then. That was a first test about whether we could transcend our tribalism. And that's really what the nation's all about. That's the lesson I think we need to learn now more than ever, that we're in danger of forgetting a bit. And the founders have a lot of wisdom for us in that because they used history to draw in. You know, they looked at the failures of democratic republics in ancient Greece and Rome very consciously. James Madison writing to Thomas Jefferson then in France saying, send me books. I want to study how these former confederacies and democracies failed so we can at least try not to make the same mistakes. A real understanding that those who do not understand history are doomed to repeat it. One of the fascinating things I found is the book that was most taken out of the first congressional library in Federal Hall in Lower Manhattan, where my wife and I were living when the book began, uh, was Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. America actually has always been torn between our native optimism, which is really our defining characteristic that we face the world with, and a deep anxiety that it's all going to go terribly wrong. Those two things have always been in tension. There are a lot of fundamental tensions that you see in the founding era that play out today. But the fact that the founders were using applied history, the fact that they were studying history and carrying it forward, not only in, in the initial debates, but also when they had to confront the failures and the shortcomings of the Articles of Confederation through the Constitutional Convention, in the Federalist Papers, referring to ancient Greek and Roman republics with these really prescient and still sadly relevant lessons, is a reminder of how the study of history is a basic obligations for citizens of a free society. Civic education is basic. It's the dues we pay. And Washington believed that enormously even though he did not have the benefit of a formal education, certainly compared to many of the founding fathers. He understood that enlightened opinion, and this is a line from the farewell, is essential to a self-governing society. So that's baked in the cake, and the founders understood it. And Washington himself, and they were so aware of not only learning from history, but from the power of their example, the power of precedent that they were setting every day. And Washington was a legitimately reluctant president. This was not a Cincinnatus pose on his part. He was simply the man who could unite the nation best after the failures of the Articles of Confederation. And his example helped solidify the nation in a crucial period where the Founding Fathers were absolutely afraid we could degenerate into a civil war. And the foreign powers in Europe were waiting for us to collapse. They, were gonna, they couldn't wait to recarve up the New World. They assumed that was inevitable. So we defied the odds by hanging together, by truly applying the wisdom of history, and finding brothership and kinship even amid all the fracturous debates between the Founding Fathers. Part of what's fun for me is the fact that they were not perfect. They were flawed. They were flawed human beings, and that, to me, makes their wisdom so much more approachable than if we put them on a pedestal. Because then the, distant, the wisdom is distant. We say, well, we can never achieve or aspire to those levels. We can't. That was a unique moment in history. But if we understand them as relatable and flawed, it makes their wisdom more accessible, and that, I think, can give us a little bit of inspiration and courage as we reach to do our part to carry forward the American story. And that's really what it's about. What's extraordinary to me, and really the genesis of the book, is the idea that Washington sat down to write a farewell address after eight successful, if contentious, and eventful years as president, 
to write a memo to us, future generations, the inheritors of this gift, about warning us about the forces that he felt could destroy democratic republic, rooted in the hard-won wisdom of his life. That's an extraordinary gift, because he could have just done what many leaders would have done, and A, not left power, B, done a valedictory victory lap. I've been a great president. Look at all these great things I've done. You're welcome. I'm going home. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that because he really was dialoguing not only with the friends and fellow citizens he addressed the farewell address to when it was published in a newspaper in September of 1796. He was writing it for us. It is a memo from the first founding father, a last revolutionary act, addressed to us about the lessons and larger cycles of history. That if you're of a certain persuasion, you believe that, well, times change, technology changes, human nature doesn't change that much. And so that's another reason to understand the larger cycles of history and take counsel of this wisdom. And so when it's published in the American Daily Advertiser in Philadelphia, he chose, by the way, not to simply deliver it to Congress because that would seem regal. He was more interested in being a little our Republican, speaking direct to the people. Um, he focused initially on the warnings, warnings about the forces he felt could destroy our democratic republic. And chief among them were hyperpartisanship, excessive debt, and foreign wars, as well as foreign powers interfering in our elections in democratic debates. As Harry Truman used to say, the only thing new in the world is the history you don't know. We obviously have been playing with these forces, in part because we have not been paying attention to our history. But we can't say Washington didn't warn us. But he did more than warn us. Washington, of course, was a man of action. So he provided us with a guide, principles, not rigid strictures, but what I call pillars of liberty to help guide us out whenever we started falling into the trap of disregarding those warnings and falling prey to hyperpartisanship, excessive debt, foreign wars. These are renewable sources of strength. And they're real great gifts, and they are rooted in his life and his understanding of history. And the reason I call them pillars of liberty isn't only because they established the scaffolding of our republic, but because the word liberty meant something a little bit different to the founding fathers than it does today. Today, I think it's fair to say we consider the words Liberty, freedom, and independence, basically synonymous. Well, the Founding Fathers didn't, and you can see it in prints from the time. They distinguish between the words. Independence is what we had won from Britain. Freedom could be a state of nature. But liberty requires a degree of self-discipline that's inherent and incumbent upon a self-governing people. So when you apply these pillars of liberty, you stabilize a free government which is itself a contradiction in terms. You stabilize that gift and you can hand it forward to future generations. That's the gift of Washington's farewell address. And I want to talk about those pillars of liberty and then a bit about the afterlife of these ideas. One was national unity. This was basic. This was fundamental. Our country was not nearly as united after the Revolutionary War as we imagine it to be today. There was no nation. States' rights were paramount. They were the primary focus of identity. There was already fears of a civil war. Washington was not a member of a political party as a matter of principle, but he was afraid that the country would divide regionally by politics and otherwise. He saw the seeds of those divisions in the Constitutional Convention and other early debates, which echo in some ways debates we have today. So he was focused on creating a national character, and he knew it had to be rooted in his own character, and he was evangelistic about it. He traveled the nation trying to communicate this idea that we were one nation, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And what he said in the farewell address about national unity, the primacy of it, I think is worth reading in part. And each of these pillars, I'm going to read just a section from the farewell. I'm not going to kill you with all 6,000 words. You're welcome. <laughs> Citizens, by birth or choice of a common country, that country has a right to concentrate your affections. The name of American, which belongs to you in your national capacity, 
must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local discrimination. Citizens by birth or choice, we are a nation of immigrants. We always have been. But then some of the dangers was defining ourselves as members of states first before the national identity. And that was a form of discrimination in upon itself that could contain the seeds of divisiveness and destruction. And Washington wanted to blunt that, really build a new foundation upon which the republic could be based. That was the fundamental passion of his presidency in many ways. This was a presidency without precedent. He was establishing all these things we take for granted now, many of which are not delineated in the Constitution. I mean, there were cabinet agencies that had four or five people, including the State Department. But Washington was also incredibly aware of how fragile this early union was, and he warned us against the people who would try to divide us to collect power, because that was a lesson rooted in human history as well. He called them pretend patriots. The people who would pretend to be more American than others, to divide Americans against one another in the name of being a better American. And that that history showed was always a path to destruction and divisiveness and tyranny and to not trust those folks. Those demagogues, and he warned about this, that one of the problems in a democracy, one of the Achilles heels is that spirit of mob rule and I, what we might call identity politics and us against them, the card that demagogues always play to divide the nation and distract it from its national interest and instead have people associate with special interests. And he warned against those forces in incredibly powerful, I think relevant ways. One of the reasons in fact that Washington was an independent president wasn't simply an oversight on his part, it was a matter of principle. He was not a member of a party by a matter of principle. And I like to point out that the Constitution actually doesn't mention political parties. It does mention journalists, however. I take great comfort from that. Uh, but it doesn't mention political parties. And that's because the founders didn't necessarily feel they were necessary. They expected congressmen would represent their constituencies and their, and their conscience. And that would be sufficient. Now, towards the end of his life, to his great pain and regret, Washington realized that was probably too much. But he was so concerned about the rise of parties, not by their own nature, but because he was afraid that the national democracy would become hijacked and divided and deadlocked by self-interested special interests at war with each other, special interests overlooking the national interests. And that kind of inefficient, ineffective democracy would create real frustration on the part of citizens so that they would soon become tempted to turn their eyes towards a demagogue with authoritarian ambitions. That's one of the things that the lessons of history taught the Founding Fathers. And that's relevant today. Now, hyperpartisanship is another of Washington's core warnings, and the pillar of liberty to counteract it is the power of political moderation. We don't think of moderation as being a source of strength today, but the Founding Fathers did. And it makes sense if you think about it for more than half a second. The Constitution that we venerate appropriately is the product of principled compromise. Principled compromise. There's an idea. Moderation is not a position of weakness. It is not the mushy middle. It's what democracy depends upon. It's rooted in classical wisdom, and the Founding Fathers understood that. That the Go back to Aristotle, where he warns about the golden mean and staying away from the extremes. Go back to Plato. He talks about moderation and, and as one of the core cardinal virtues of humanity. This is a position of strength. It is a position of bedrock wisdom that democracy depends upon. And we've forgotten that, but Washington was devoted to it, and it caused him great pain to see these partisan squabbles erupt underneath his nose and in his cabinet, his two most talented surrogate sons, Hamilton and Jefferson, secretly scheming to create political parties. It was the opposite of what he wanted. It was the opposite of what he wished, but he recognized he was powerless to stop it. It was an outgrowth of freedom. But he realized that what we were not powerless to do was to keep political parties in check, keep them in proper perspective, not have them mistake themselves as the purpose of our politics. They're not. And what Washington said in the farewell, I think, rings incredibly true today. And it's a quote I used in my book, Wingnuts, because it particularly applied to the extreme edges. Quote, 
The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetuated the most horned enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. It serves always to distract public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the communities with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasional riot and insurrection. There being constant danger of excess, the effort be, ought to be by force of public opinion to mitigate and assuage it. That's us. Mitigate and assuage it. The metaphor he uses is, in the next line is, unless like a fire, instead of warming it should consume. Fire is an incredibly useful tool. It's also, of course, bears with it the promise of destruction, and so too with hyperpartisan politics, which is why a muscular moderation is so important to a democracy, and that tradition has almost entirely been forgotten, but it is rooted foundationally in the Founding Fathers' wisdom and in George Washington's visions and actions in office. It's vitally important, it seems to me, that we remember that because so much else flows from it. But there are other larger cycles of history that can be incredibly destructive on democratic republics, and one of them is excessive debt. It can sound wonky. It has in the past been dismissed as a concern only of an elite few, a banking class, fiscal conservatives. But Washington and Alexander Hamilton, who was his primary ghostwriter on the second and final draft of the farewell address, understood that excessive debt, excessive debt, had always been a force that could bring down empires. These are larger forces that we are playing with. And this is all rooted in the idea of liberty and self-discipline, liberty and self-sufficiency. Excessive debt is the opposite of that. A little bit of debt, Hamilton knew, having studied from Robert Morris before him, could be an incredibly powerful good thing for a democratic republic. But excessive debt, that carries the seeds of doom with it, and no one and no country is immune. And they'd learned that lesson, by the way, during the revolution, as you and your ancestors well knew. Part of the fight wasn't just on the battlefield, it's that we didn't have the finances to conduct and win the war, and it's when we finally got money from the Dutch and elsewhere that we were able to marshal the forces to win the war. That's because Robert Morris took control of the financial system away from the states. Alexander Hamilton had a great line. He said, trying to get money from the states is like a preacher trying to communicate to the dead. <laughs> Even then, the states were fracturous. There's a reason the Articles of Confederation didn't work so well, but it was really almost a mission-critical problem at the heart of the revolution and why we failed. Excessive debt, lack of capitalization, lack of financing. Hamilton understood it. Washington reluctantly learned it. He really hated speculators, by the way. It took him a while to get comfortable with debt, but he did. And here's what he wrote in the farewell address. He said, as a very important source of strength and security, cherish public credit. Do not ungenerously throw upon posterity the burden which we ourselves ought to bear. That excessive debt's a form of generational theft. That we have a responsibility through, if we get in a war, pay for it. That was the way the Founding Fathers understood debt primarily. It was something you incurred during wartime and something you paid off during peacetime without getting too in the weeds, although I can with this crew. I mean, part of the reason we have the Revolutionary War is because of English debts over the French and Indian War. So these are lessons that are incredibly relevant. And as much as we all righteously complain about taxes, that is imbued in human nature. Go back to the Bible and you can find lots of comfort. Washington said this, to have revenue, there must be taxes. And no taxes may be devised which are not more or less inconvenient and unpleasant. We're not going to make taxation popular, but we can make it fair. And Oliver Holmes was right. It is the price we pay for civilization. Washington understood that. But this was really a profound thing for him, not only because as a farmer he went into debt and bitterly resented the British company he was in debt to, because it was an infringement upon his liberty, his freedom, his self-sufficiency. But one of the most poignant stories of the early founding era had to do with Robert Morris, the financier of the revolution, who I mentioned just a second ago. Washington offered him treasury secretary. He didn't want it. That's why we got Alexander Hamilton. He preferred to stay in private business and serve as a senator from Pennsylvania. The second executive mansion was actually his house, leased to the government, where Washington wrote the farewell address. But even Robert Morris 
fell prey to excessive debt. He fell in with a, a shady character who said he had a lot of access to foreign capital. Tobias Lear, Washington's private secretary, got in on the scheme, and the North American Land Company was briefly uh, controlled around 60% of the acreage in six states, probably the largest landowners in American history. But then a foreign war broke out. Creditors called. Robert Morris was ruined. He was cast out of polite society. He was thrown in debtor's prison on Prune Street. And I think it speaks a lot not only to that visceral danger of debt, but also says a lot about Washington's character that he almost alone didn't cut him off. Martha invited his wife and children to Mount Vernon to stay with them. And Washington actually became the only president ever to dine with an inmate in a prison. Talk about the power of example. Talk about the power of mercy and forgiveness and friendship. It's a powerful story that also is about the danger of debt that I think spoke deeply to Washington in elevating that principle. Another principle, a pillar of liberty we don't talk as much about or is cast off as a partisan concern is the importance of virtue and morality and religion in a self-governing society. But Washington's religion is sometimes, as people's are, simplified, taken over by one um, clique that wants to claim him as their own. Washington's faith is actually fascinating and perhaps more contemporarily resonant and relevant than it might seem on the surface. Yes, he was absolutely baptized in Anglican. He served on the vestry of his church, which should still have the plaque outside it. Thank you very much. But <laughs> not like a cheap applause line, but I do, I do believe it. Um, but he was also very much a, a Mason and influenced by, by the, that teaching and talked about the great architect of the universe. He didn't write the letter, the word Jesus Christ in any letters, for example. He didn't actually take communion, and there were priests who were disappointed with him for that. He didn't kneel uh, during church services. Um, he actually was also an enormous fan of Seneca and the Stoics. So he sort of cobbled together his own faith tradition in the context of his time. But what he understood was is that religion was the most effective means of teaching morality. And morality was essential to a self-governing society. He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports, pillars of liberty. But it really was actually a belief in pluralism and religious tolerance that really helps it stand out. What to me is the most moving testament of Washington's belief in religious pluralism is his letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, where he welcomes a persecuted people here. And he explains that it's his belief that virtue and happiness are entwined and they, we will not be a country that gives bigotry sanction. He says, we will give bigotry no sanction. That's a founding value right from the mouth of the first founding father, a commitment to religious pluralism and tolerance and diversity that we always would do well to remember. And that is core to Washington's vision of virtue and morality and religion as a bedrock of our liberty. He really thought it was a mistake to denigrate religion. It didn't matter necessarily whether he was a sectarian believer or not, or what the founding fathers' different visions of religion were. Some of them couldn't get through a primary today, I imagine. But th they thought it was a great mistake to denigrate the role of a religion in a free society because a self-governing people depend upon virtue and morality, and religion is the most effective means of teaching that on a wide scale. Doesn't matter what religion, interestingly, I found one note um, where he's looking for a new hand on, on Mount Vernon, and his, um, maybe it's his cousin Lawrence writes to him, and, or Augustine writes to him and says, um, you know, who, who, do you, who should we hire? And he writes a note back, something to the effect of, Look, I don't care if they're a, a Protestant, a Catholic, uh, they're Jewish, Mahatman, or of no religion at all as long as they can do the job. It's a fascinating insight. The other great pillar of liberty, sometimes at odds in current debates with virtue, morality, and religion, is education, specifically a concept of public education. And Washington was the least formally educated founding father, and he felt this acutely. He was actually quite insecure about his ability to serve as president. He was not the flashiest wit. He was not the brightest mind at the dinner table. Other people were far more formally educated. He spoke only English. The other founding fathers 
could all speak multiple languages. And he was insecure about it in almost an endearing way, although he was a deep autodidact. His library, as many of you know, had over 900 volumes in it. He really was fascinated about the creation of an American literature. And he really was fascinated and fixated on the promise of education to create a national culture, a glue of national unity. Really reflecting the belief that for him, all education was a form of civic education. And he had a particular legislative hobby horse that he hammered home and had a great fascinating fight with Alexander Hamilton about, the creation of a national university. It's a reminder, by the way, that even George Washington couldn't get through whatever he wanted with Congress. He wanted to build a national university, and the reason was he wanted to bring the best and the brightest from different states and to create basically a governing class that would get to know each other as people and not be tempted to say, well, you're from South Carolina, I'm from North Carolina, you must die. Or, you know, New Hampshire versus North Carolina. To really solidify by relationships and education and national culture and friendships that could solidify the nation going forward. Here's what he wrote in the farewell address. Quote, promote then as an object of primary importance institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge. In proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion, it is essential that public opinion should be enlightened. Democracies depend upon enlightened opinion. Education is the way to achieve that, and all education is a form of civic education. That's the briefest segment of this 6,000-word address that qualifies as a pillar of liberty, and the reason is Hamilton kept taking it out. Going back and forth by mail between Philadelphia and New York, Hamilton kept saying, this is really better for your address to Congress. And Washington kept putting it back in, and Hamilton kept taking it back out. He knew it wasn't popular with Congress. And in the final version, which is in the New York Library, Washington actually literally cuts and pastes this paragraph on religion, because it's that important to him. And in his address to Cons uh, Congress subsequently, he says, we need to build a national war college, what would become West Point, he got his wish but also a national university, going so far as to draw funds to create a national university on the lands that are now the Naval Observatory, where the Vice President lives. But again, Congress wasn't about to just do whatever the President said. It's a co-equal branch of government after all, something we could remember at times. And that's the reason why we have the University of North Carolina and the University of Virginia, but not a national university. They overruled him on that one, but he got the, much of the intended effect. But that, in some ways, I think is perhaps the purest connection to the mission of the American Revolution Institute and what you all achieved to do. It's not only to perpetuate the memory, but to carry it forward. Civic education is key. It is essential to a democracy. That means honoring our past. That means also elevating the debate in a nation and making sure it's enlightened. Democracy doesn't work without that. It devolves to a mob too quickly. The final pillar of liberty is a foreign policy of independence, peace through strength. And this is often misinterpreted and misremembered. First of all, the phrase entangling alliances, that's the quote most of you all know from the farewell address, right? It does not appear in the farewell address. <laughs> that was from Jefferson's first inaugural, which itself is a funny story. Um, Washington was not advocating isolationism with his suspicion about foreign wars and foreign powers. What he was saying was, we as a nation need to become self-sufficient. We need time to build up our strength militarily and economically, and we should not be dependent upon another nation or act as its satellite, because nations, unlike individuals, should there, there are no deep friendships. There are only interests. He was, however, a great believer in extending one principle in the geopolitical world of nations, which is honesty. I'll read you what he wrote. He said, observe good faith and justice toward all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. The great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is extending our commercial relations, to have with them as little political connection as possible. But then he says, and I'm distilling a bit, we will, over time, and he said 20 years in a series of letters, build up strength economically, militarily, where we can be seen as an independent nation on the world stage, and then, we may choose peace or war as our interest guided by justice shall counsel. That is not an isolationist hymn. This is about a focus on self-sufficiency. And Washington also famously said in an address to Congress that the most effectual means of peace is to prepare for war. Cribbing off an ancient Roman, applied history. 
But this has been intentionally misremembered and oversimplified. The real point of it was that we could not throw in and should not throw in with any of the feuding foreign powers on the continent of Europe. Easier said than done. You know, we forget, I think, sometimes the great blessing of geography, which is part of what established our success. We don't really talk or think about geography much anymore. Will Rogers had a great line uh, how about, uh, you know, America had the two greatest friends any nation ever had. You know who they are? The Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Yeah. This was a great gift. Why in the world would we choose between England and France in a war they're fighting during Washington's administration? That's a fool's errand. But Jefferson and Madison in particular were furious about that. They saw the French as our allies. After all, they bailed us out in the revolution. They were extending the empire of liberty. Hamilton and Washington and Adams looked at what was happening in the streets of France and said that that's not liberty, that's a new form of tyranny. And actually, as a rebuke to those sort of fanboys of the French Revolution, he uh, put a uh, portrait of King Louis in the executive mansion, even after he had his head lopped off, um, as a reminder of who our real ally was. It was that France, it was not the Jacobin government of France, and that he was determined in signing the Proclamation of Neutrality that America would walk and should walk a durable middle path between monarchy and the mob. He understood, as Hamilton also did, that, tyr that uh, anarchy is the quickest path to tyranny. That's what history shows, and the French Revolution was proven that all over again. Well, the sort of French Revolution apologists and romanticists were not too happy about that, and the revolutionary government sent over a guy named Citizen Genet over to the United States, who's not widely remembered today, but his job in part was to sway public opinion, to get Washington to renounce the uh, proclamation of neutrality, and if that didn't work, to overthrow the government. America's two-party system really begins here because Madison and Jefferson throw in together secretly. They hire a, a college a buddy of uh, Madison's named Phil Freneau to run a partisan newspaper attacking the foreign policy of uh, the Washington administration in this regard. Freneau says, look, that's, you're not going to be able to pay me enough uh, to get to move to uh, Philadelphia. There's just not enough money. And he said, well, <laughs> Jefferson says, look, it's okay. I run the State Department. I'll hire you as a clerk. So, the partisan newspaper attacking the foreign policy of the administration is being run out of the State Department. I mean, you know, lest we romanticize the past a little too much, I mean, you know, partisan press, not a new thing, uh, rivalries, not a new thing, but this actually is, is something close to treason. Um, but Washington would not be swayed. There were riots, there were insurrections. Ultimately, by the way, a new round of Jacobins took over. Genet realized he was homeless, married to American, George Clinton's daughter, begged for forgiveness, and Washington ensured that he wasn't hung, uh, which is more than he would have given Washington had the tables been turned. But that's about the importance of neutrality as a principle of independence, a foreign policy of independence. We should not have permanent attachment to one nation or another because it will cloud our judgment. It will distort our sense of self-interest. And we should, we may choose to get into a war, but it will be as our interest guided by justice shall counsel. These core wisdoms were revolutionary and revelatory at the time. Washington publishes them in the Philadelphia Daily Advertiser. It's September 19th, 1796, and he is already rolling out of town on the way back to Mount Vernon by the time the paper hits the streets. He wants it to speak for himself, and he knows it's going to be disseminated across the country, and it, it is, and it does, although it takes several months for it to reach Kentucky and Vermont. Um, but people are buzzing about it, and it has the intended effect. He wants to give us, his friends and fellow citizens and future generations, these pillars of liberty, this wisdom to carry forward. And it becomes the most celebrated civic document in American history. It is more widely reprinted than the Declaration of Independence for the first 150 years of our republic. It's particularly reprinted after his death, of course, and then in the War of 1812. I should also say, by the way, that his last will and testament, I believe, functions as sort of a coda for the uh, farewell address, because he doesn't mention slavery in the farewell address. But when he releases his slaves upon his wife's death and chooses that version, it was also intended as an example. Belated, too late to be sure for many, but it was intended to be an example 
And, and he really did think of slavery as a scourge, that we were captive to a cruel economy, and said even to Edmund Randolph that if there were to be a civil war between the states, he would throw in with the North. But so the, the farewell address carries this enormous weight. The afterlife of the address is huge. Jefferson's inaugural address, Jefferson's been feuding with Washington the entire time. By the end of Washington's administration, Jefferson is not welcome at Mount Vernon. Martha won't see him. That's how bad the blood is. When he becomes president, he gives an inaugural address, and he basically becomes a born-again Washingtonian. Virtually all the principles in the farewell address he adopts as his own. It's extraordinary, and he's fairly eloquent and much more concise, and comes up with the phrase entangling alliances. That afterlife of the idea carries such weight that Andrew Jackson's farewell address is entirely a riff, a reminiscence about the wisdom of Washington's farewell address talking about how we had been through the testing period, the Constitution worked, do not listen to those pretend patriots who will say that we should secede and divide as a nation. That's what Washington warned about, don't do it. Abraham Lincoln's 1860s stump speech quotes the farewell address at length, pushing back in part against the idea that Republicans were a regional political party. He said, no, Democrats have become that. And during the Civil War, Lincoln requires that the farewell address be read aloud not just to Congress, a tradition which continues today in the Senate, but to troops in the field to remind them what they're fighting for. After the war, it becomes required reading in America's public schools. There are contests to see who can recite it. There are oratory contests. There are essay contests. This thing was memorized and diagrammed, and it's 6,000 words. I mean, I don't believe the people in the past were any smarter than us, but I'm pretty sure that you know, grade school me couldn't look at a 6,000 word address, let us memorize it. Um, but this was really a civic, not indoctrination, but it was treated as civic mythology that we needed to ingest with the explicit understanding at the time that the reason they were doing this is because if we'd listened to Washington, maybe we wouldn't have had the war in the first place. So we forget wisdom at its peril. Now, over time, it starts to fade. It starts to fade in part because Lincoln becomes the new national unifying figure. The Gettysburg Address becomes our go-to civic scripture. And it helps that it's 272 words. It's easier to remember and memorize people. But also, it is the New Testament to the Farewell Address's Old Testament. It's a poetic rumination on life after death. And the Farewell Address is rules of behavior dispatched by a distant God. It is heavy but it's foundational and fundamental. It remains a great debate going into the First World War, debate held between two Washington scholars, Woodrow Wilson and Henry Cabot Lodge, about who's a better representative of Washington, who should we get involved in the war. Wilson wins the first round, Cabot Lodge wins the second with the League of Nations. It's really central to our national psyche in a way it is not today. Um, there is one fascinating moment in the run-up to World War II that I think is worth talking about, and not just because it looks like, a, in retrospect, a, a scene out of the Twilight Zone. 1939, February, rally at Madison Square Garden. The German-American Bund holds a pro-American rally. If you walk in the hall, there is a 30-foot banner of George Washington flanked by swastikas. A guy dressed up as a Nazi comes out and gives the keynote address. On the floor, pamphlets are being handed out calling George Washington the first Nazi. And he gives a keynote address all about the farewell address, talking about how Washington said we shouldn't get involved in foreign wars. We're spending too much money in the New Deal. This is excessive debt. That we should be focused more on religion and morality and true Americanism. Now, there are a couple ironies here. Washington warned about pretend patriots. This isn't even subtle. I mean, they're dressed up as Nazis. They're being paid for by the Third Reich, explicitly to try to divide the nation by claiming a mantle of pure Americanism while wearing German uniforms, which has always seemed peculiar to me. But um, it is a vivid reminder not only of the pretend patriots that Washington warned about, but also how we have to be incredibly careful about odious misappropriation of the Founding Fathers. That's part of our and your sacred trust as well, to make sure it's not being twisted to represent one faction or another. Now, the good news is there was major blowback on that, not surprisingly. Um, they all ultimately went to the pokey, uh, but they thought they could get away with it. Over time, of course, the farewell dress faded further, but it remained an inspiration for presidents. 
Eisenhower's farewell address continues that warning to future generations. His warning was the congressional military industrial complex. He dropped the congressional because he decided it would be a little too difficult to have it resonate with the intended audience. So the military industrial complex, but intentionally influenced by Washington's farewell. Um, Johnson used to love to quote the farewell address about the importance of education. Reagan loved to quote it about the importance of religion and morality. He quoted Washington's farewell in the Moscow State University address about American values and the importance of religion in our society. President Obama, the day that Washington's, my book came out on Washington's farewell address, I was flying to Chicago to cover the, Wash, uh, the, the Obama farewell. Um, and there towards the end, his great theme, warning theme, because this is literally now just what presidents do, because Washington's example is threats to our democracy. And he quoted Washington's farewell address at length about when we weaken the ties that define us by saying that some Americans are more American than others. That there is no backstop in a democracy other than we the people. And he encapsulated really well, I think, the core distilled wisdom of Washington's farewell that we need to carry forward. The idea that our independence as a nation is inseparable from our interdependence as a people. Our independence as a nation is inseparable from our interdependence as a people. Washington understood it. The best presidents certainly have. That's what Obama was saying as well. And so that's why I think, for me, the farewell address, and I think really the mission of carrying forward the founding fathers in civic education and other vehicles, like the play Hamilton did so well, a great gift at making that old story new again, is to carry those first principles forward is to remind us that this is a sacred obligation, a gift that's been handed to us that we have an obligation to hand to the next generation, ideally better than it was handed to us, to form a more perfect union. And, and I think it's not just making these messages resonate and relevant with a nation that is far more diverse, of course, than the Founding Fathers were. It's also, I think, that this is a document that has core pillars of wisdom that can appeal to people on the right and left. It's a document that can remind us that there is still fundamentally more than unites us than divides us, and this is common heritage, and that it really is incumbent upon us to inspire a new generation of Washingtonians who will put country over party, who will balance the, strike the wise balance between individual liberty and generational responsibility, who will be aware of overextension in all its forms, economic, political, and foreign policy. This is a tradition we can carry forward, and the founding farewell address, it seems to me, is a unique vehicle to do it, to help recenter our debates, to create a sense of common ground and common purpose that we can carry forward together as friends and fellow citizens. So thank you very much. I don't know if I have time for questions, but. John, John, thank you. Thank you for articulating ideas which are sacred to us and that we hope to, to revive in this country. Uh, faith in the founders, respect for their dramatic accomplishments, for their wisdom, despite the fact that they were flawed, real human beings like all of us and as descendants of the heroes of the revolution. The mission that you outline is sacred to us. It is the purpose of our organization. It is our vision that Americans will cherish these ideals again in the ways that they should. John is contented, contented to answer your questions, respond to your comments, uh, and I'm sure you'll, I'll leave it to you to moderate them yourself. I, I, you. I'm, I'm acutely aware I'm standing between you and drinks and dinner, so I also <laughs> don't want to push your hospitality, but, but if you have any, I'd be delighted to take them. They don't need to be shy. Yes, sir. Bernard de Montferrand, I have a question about your interpretation of the foreign policy legacy of uh, George Washington. You speak about uh, independence instead of uh, unilateral uh, sort of uh, independence. Uh, in politics, what is important is perception and mm -hmm. not always reality. And in fact, the words of uh, 
George Washington have always been interpreted or percept that the perception was uh, a, a, a perception of isolationism. And either in the United States or abroad, the roots of the foreign policy of, the Amer of America have always been related to uh, no entangling alliances of uh, those words which have been so important. Are you, aren't you underestimating this, uh, this interpretation? I, I, so the gentleman is asking me, I assume from a German perspective, um, <laughs> that, um, that um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. But, um, but you know, if, if, the, if the received wisdom, if politics is perception, as he says, in which I agree, uh, that if the received wisdom of Washington's farewell address is that it's an endorsement of isolationism, shouldn't we just deal with that as it is? Um, I agree with you, politics is perception, but I also think that that's why you want to drill down on the original documents and get as close to the original tent as you can. And I think that's actually a fundamental misunderstanding of what he was saying. Um, certainly in the trajectory of the nation, it was about building strength over time. It was not about throwing indefinitely in with one nation or another. But I also think principles are guidelines. This is not a straitjacket. And I think that's the debate we had around World War I, whether we should get in or not. We had an all another debate around World War II. You know, the, in the run-up to World War II, a lot of folks really regretted the decision to get in World War I. And then we saw the first evolution of the America First movement. And there were some principled people who really thought that America was better taking advantage of the fact that we were isolated from the troubles of Europe. And there were other people who were motivated by rank anti-Semitism. Um, but they invoked Washington alike. Um, I think that that is why we need to say, hold on, let's look at what he said. Endless foreign wars, probably not in line with what Washington said. Uh, firm fixed alliances, whether they're in our interest or not, probably not what he said. But he does carefully say, as I pointed out, as our interest and sense of justice may guide us. And, and Eisenhower, who was a real Washington aficionado, of course, you know, came to the presidency after not only winning the Second World War, but by leading NATO. And there was a whole debate over NATO uh, that involved whether it was consistent with Washington's wisdom. We'd rejected the, the, the League of Nations on those grounds. I think NATO was something much closer. Um, it didn't have some of the automatic triggers into to war, article, debates about Article 5 aside. So, so I think that's why I think, yes, politics is perception, but it's good to look back at the original tense so we're not simply captive to it. And I think actually Washington's vision of foreign policy is incredibly relevant. It is a very almost globalist vision, albeit anticipating something far into the future, of commercial relations between nations and those being a check on war because of mutual self-interest. He very much has that vision, and he articulates it beautifully in a long letter to Lafayette. That was his fondest hope. But he also felt we needed to be prepared for war to dissuade people from trying to come, uh, you know, knock us off on the world stage. Any others? I'm not scary. <laughs> well, all right then. Oh, wait, yes, sir? Do you have one? Nope. Okay. I am. Uh, what, what I said at the beginning is, you know, the American character, even if you look at the earliest days of the, of the Republic, we are native optimists as Americans, but there's always been a deep undercurrent of anxiety uh, about the future, and that's true in our earliest days. I think that's still true today. My favorite quote about optimism is actually uh, attributed to Abraham Lincoln, who I'm going to write my next book about, and I'm beginning the researching stage, and, and it's fun. But He's said to have said, I'm an optimist because I don't see the point in being anything else. <laughs> um, that's the way I feel about, about optimism. Look, we are a strong country. Uh, we have 200 years um, of history under our belt. We have civic institutions, but it's up to we, the people, to withstand them, to, to strengthen them, to participate. There is no backstop in a democracy other than we, the people, which is why if we get civically lazy, if we start thinking participation in politics and civic life and public service is someone else's job, well, that's how we start going down the path that other nations have in the past. Every generation needs to reaffirm its commitment, and partly that's understanding the history and teaching civic education and also stepping up in our own ways in forms of public service at different stations at different times. 
it's not something you can outsource. You know, and there's a lot about the ancient Romans uh, where it said that citizens ceased being soldiers and soldiers ceased being citizens. That's a warning sign. That's why studying history is really important. What are these larger forces that have torn down democratic republics and empires in the past? Let's learn about that. Let's anticipate it as best we can and then counteract it as best we can. This is the greatest nation in the history of Earth. There's no question about it in my mind. Um, that increases our obligation to defend it, not in a, in, a, in a jealous, possessive way, but from a sense of optimism, being aware of the dangers that can come from taking it for granted. And look, liberal democracy, which we basically invented in its modern incarnation, certainly diverse liberal democracy, is under challenge abroad, as well as us suffering from a tide of ethno-nationalism at home, which is also seen abroad in reaction to globalization. We, as the world's paragon premier first examples of diverse liberal democracy need to defend that tradition at home and abroad because there are other systems emerging that are challenging that and there's been no system that's led to more freedom or prosperity or equality than a diverse, our diverse liberal democracy. But we know the end of history is not here so we have to study history a little bit deeper. And, and I think when you look at nations pitching alternate systems like wealth without liberty, you know, um, which is incredibly dangerous, where surveillance states emerge, but people say, hey, you know, it's okay, you can have a great party in Shanghai, don't worry about a little civil liberties here or there. You know, that's something that we want to keep in mind, at least in contrast. We have a tradition to defend, and that tr tradition is rooted in all the ideas behind a diverse liberal democracy. You don't give up civil liberties in exchange for security. You defend those traditions, too. Um, and, and so that's why I think studying history is so important and then trying, however imperfectly, to carry it forward and to realize that, you know, is this a civic stress test? Yes. Are we going to have to learn from this? Yes. Can we and get stronger and better? Yes. I believe we can. All right. Drinks and dinner. Thank you. house we'll have drinks and food in that order um, and John has consented to sign copies of his book which we'll have set up in the courtyard of Anderson house and each and every couple here is entitled to one if you came by yourself you're entitled to one too uh, <laughs> so uh, please come over enjoy yourself the fellowship of the Cincinnati uh, famous as it is is uh, on exhibit let's go across the street